Hello, hello. It's my Wednesday night day. I know. It's our standing day. And I have a new hair hat. I love it. I love it. I got I got hair. Yes, you're a blondie. You're very blonde. And I, and I love these, by the way. I love your neck necklaces and, and everything. The whole thing. You're very fashionable. You're very wow. fashionable. Just like your granddaughter. It's very fashionable. Um, but we're not here to talk about fashion, of course. Um, give us a little intro about Amy Stacy Curtis, who's backstage. So Amy, okay, so backstory. I didn't realize that I recognized her until I was already inviting her to come on the show. So Amy lives in Maine and she is an installation artist, which she'll explain to everybody that isn't sure what that is. She'll explain it. It's amazing. And she caught my eye on TikTok because she was strumming the ukulele. And as you know, I'm trying to learn my ukulele. And so I started watching her. And then I got deeper into her story because she talks about it. And it turns out she has this amazing heroic story. It's still unfolding. It has to do with health and wrong diagnoses, which you know how I am about that. <laughs> and uh, she's using music to heal. And it's really beautiful. She has a really scary, tragic story. But now it's really beautiful to watch her healing process yeah and we love so, stuff like that i mean that's the whole part of and the then i realized one day after i invited her on that she was in lewiston and i was like i think i've seen her name before and sure enough i remember her name on an installation project she did it's and she a very small it. world it's a she very posted small. pictures of it and stuff and i was like oh, i didn't know her <laughs> That's hilarious. I love stuff like that. So yeah. we're going to have, she's even going to play a song for us, right? I think. Yeah, I think we'll do that probably on the way out. Okay. So here's her video intro before we bring her mm -hmm. on that MM put together because she, in her spare time, she also <laughs> produces. And, and Actually, and, a lot yeah. of them lately, and they've had great TikToks and stuff, and I've just been able to use that. So I can't remember if I added to hers or cut it. We'll see. All right, let's see. In March 2017, I started seeing horrific movies in my brain. After two psychiatric wards, eight antipsychotic drugs, and 15 months of schizophrenia diagnosing doctors, about nine months into my psychosis, I lost control of all my muscles and my speech. Doctors started looking at these new problems, the things they could see. But stopping the movies in my brain was most important to me. Fifteen months into my psychosis, I met with a naturopath who determined that I had had Lyme disease, which was never treated. He explained that when Lyme disease isn't treated enough or at all, it can cause psychosis, loss of muscle control, facial palsy, speech difficulty, as well as other things I was experiencing. Fatigue, sensitivity to light and sound, and seizure activity. He said, this is essentially a brain injury I'm confident you can recover from. But my natural path said it could take time before my non-stop psychosis went away. By now it had been 20 months and I couldn't wait. A friend had suggested electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, which used to be called electroshock therapy. After my 16th ECT treatment for the first time in almost two years, I saw a flash of something different in my mind, something other than me ending my life. In two more years, the psychosis was finally gone. In the last year and a half, my speech and muscle control has improved even more thanks to playing the ukulele. And this is crazy because I wanted to say my dad just got diagnosed with Lyme disease. So I'm learning. I have a dog in this fight where I want to learn as much as I possibly can. But That's that is sick. so affecting. That, that just affected me so much. It reminds me of what Linda, well, LR went through. Very similar. Going undiagnosed, having the mental health issues, nobody knew what was wrong, and it ended up being a fixable health issue, you know, like a treatable health issue. And right. you know, she's thriving, and yeah, it, that, it hits me. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's really, it's really a lot. Well, let's bring Amy up and yes. get into it with her. Amy, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here. Hi, Julia. Hi, Amy. 
Um, why don't you start by introducing yourself and um, I guess tell your side of the story, if there, what you want to add to what we just watched. Um, what was the total time frame? Like, when did this first start? Um, this all this all started for me um, in early March 2017. I had um, just finished an 18-year project that was my big focus as an installation artist. Um, I had set out between 1998 and 2016 to um, create uh, nine master of exhibits of installation art in different mills throughout the state of Maine. And um, each show took 22 months of work. And then I would take two months off between each exhibit. And um, each of the exhibits had a different theme that I had predetermined at the beginning of the 18 year um, process. And um, at each, for each show, I would create uh, nine large in scope or large scale interactive works, meaning the audience um, resolve each piece. There was instructions that the audience would use to know what I wanted them to do to kind of complete my creative process and the concepts. And um, each of the mills that I used, I cleaned them by hand, like detailing really big cars sometimes bringing them up to code. Um, it was a massive uh, project and <clears throat> I um, had just uh, completed the project and was um, making new work in my studio, um, thinking about ideas that were outside of that sort of structure. It was a very like structured um, project. I considered it to be my opus and, you know, setting out to do something of that scale every two years requires a lot of discipline. So now I was settling into a new kind of art making, which was um, with no format I could just make just to make. And I was really excited about it. In the meantime, um, to shell it, kind of celebrate uh, what I had accomplished, um, one of the the museum directors in the state had um, brainchild this idea to to celebrate what I had done with a nine institution retrospective of my work. So there was going to be a different exhibit um, in nine different places in different museums around the state in conjunction with a book that I had been writing about my project coming out all at the same time. So um, I uh, it was about five months. I was about five months into my my new studio work, or I should say, I'd taken two months off to rest from the ninth and final show of Biennial, which is what I call these shows. Um, and that ninth, ninth exhibit was in the Lewis in Lewis and Main State's Mill. And um, so I had actually been working in my studio three months. Um, and at the end of each each work day. What I tended to do if I wasn't um, going out or visiting with a friend, I lived very rurally at the time in Lyman, Maine. Uh, so you had to kind of drive an hour to get anywhere. Um, what I would often do is just veg after work, and I like to veg mostly by watching um, movies that I've seen over and over again that give me comfort. Um, so I especially like disaster movies because um, things will be going really well and then all of a sudden there's all kinds of chaos, chaos, chaos. And then um, the world is safe 
and that kind of like repetition of that um that kind of story over and over again even if i've seen it many times um it's very comforting so i was trying to decide what kind of disaster or horror movie i wanted to watch i was uh deep impact or armageddon or jaws are some of my favorites um, when all of a sudden I was just at the end of my bed um, thinking about what movie I was going to watch in bed. When all of a sudden the switch flipped in my brain. And um, I was seeing all of a sudden this horrific image just filling my brain um, of me ending my life. Um, what that would look like in that particular room that I was in, which is my bedroom. And um, it alarmed me quite a bit um, because uh, it was just a scary thing to be seen. Um, and when I went out in the kitchen, because it jarred me so much, all of a sudden the, that movie shifted to how I would end my life in the kitchen. And I was starting to notice that right away that I couldn't turn it off. It was a constant thing that I was seeing in my head and it was playing over and over again. So I would go through the process of ending my life and then it would start over all based on what room I was in and what tools were in the room or whatever situation um, to accomplish that. I knew immediately that something was very wrong. Um, I had struggled with um, suicidal ideation most of my life from when I was seven years old because I had witnessed my own um, father die by suicide. And it was a, uh, it changed the course of my life and um, my life contained a lot of um, diff very difficult things after that. I spent much of my adult life from 25 years old till about 45 years old healing from that uh, CPTSD that I had and suicidal ideation that I had from what I had experienced as a child. So can I just ask, how old were you when this started? So I had done that work through 45 years old. This started um, right, right before my 47th birthday. So I, I had um, done all kinds of work to get through that, through the um, PTSD and ideation, the thing that ultimately um, got it to stop was EMDR eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. Mm -hmm. But I had also done, you know, between 25 years old and that point, lots of therapy, like 11 or 12 years of therapy and um, different body work and things. And I feel like um, having all that sort of uh, pre-work that I had done made doing the EMDR a little more accessible to me because I had a lot of language and narrative already about how I felt about certain things and how I perceived certain things. So that was really helpful. But the EMDR, uh, after I did that, and I had about a year of EMDR, um, we go, go through a lot of different uh, traumas um, to work through them. Um, for the first time, I felt um, very felt free and light um, and I had like been experiencing that for two years before this all started. It was like um, reaching into a refrigerator and thinking you're going to pick up a full jug of water and it's actually empty. So you reach in, you grab it, you expect to be empty, but it's light and your hand kind of flies up. Um, that's how I felt in my body after freeing myself from that um, ideation. So when I started walking up the stairs um, to to my um, husband's office, I knew something was really wrong um, because 
first of all, I hadn't had ideation in two years, but this felt completely different. Yeah. What I good. what I had experienced before. Um, what I experienced before were more like thoughts and um, you know, clinical depression, you know, being in bed a lot and things. And this is just wholly different from, from so, I think in one of your videos didn't you explain itself or I'm pretty sure it was you that said it was like watching a movie of what you like you doing that. Instead of just the thought of doing it, you are actually seeing yourself go do yeah, that. So, and most of the time that that movie was from outside of myself. But there were points where the intensity would change, where I would see it as if I was inside myself, so as it was happening happening from inside my body. But the key point is that um, these were never hallucinations. It was just something that I was always seeing in my brain. So I knew something was really wrong. Um, made an appointment with my primary care physician um, at the time. And um, she didn't really know um, what to think about it, I think, at the time, um, but prescribed just for now uh, any uh, antidepressant. And I had never actually taken an antidepressant before, which I think is astounding when I think in retrospect um, that all the things that I did to try to heal it were non-drug related and it's probably why it took so long. I'm sure that there is points when drugs might have helped me, but I just didn't end up doing that. So she had prescri she prescribed an antidepressant and said, if this continues, um, or if you if you feel like it starts to get worse, really all you can do is go to the emergency room and um, you know go on suicide watch or something. But she didn't really know what to do at the time. You were just um, so you were immediately treated as though it was psychiatric. Like yeah. Immediately. Immediately. So um, and I and I even then said to her. I feel like there is something physically wrong with my brain. Like there's something wrong. And um, that was, I think that's just a common response. There's so, no worse feeling than to go to the hospital or to a doctor for help it was and very, not be heard, not be heard. Yeah, it's very, very frustrating and it happened over and over. So um, after, Three days, it it didn't get better and it never stopped unless I was sleeping. Um, and I just got more and more scared. So did end up going to the local emergency room where I was immediately, um, it took like you have to sit in the, the emergency room for a while before you talk to somebody, but they, they said it would be best to to be in a psychiatric ward while this is figured out. Um, and again, I was reiterating, I think there's something wrong with my brain at the same time, like explaining what I'm seeing at the same time saying, my life is awesome. I just finished this incredible project. I'm so excited to, about my future and what I'm doing. I don't have suicidal ideation, yet my brain won't stop showing me these things. So I think something's wrong. Um, so I was admitted into my first, the first of two psychiatric wards while um, this, while trying to figure out what this is. In the psychiatric ward, um, I was put on an antipsychotic. Um, my team there was made up of a, um, psychotherapists and nurses that were very nice and they were very receptive to what I was saying. Um, and they commented over and over, I've never seen anything like this before where there's a person who has severe um, suicidal ideation yet doesn't have suicidal ideation, like has the kids experiencing two opposites of the spectrum at the same time. 
Um, but we still we want to put you on antipsychotics just to see if it will help, like to see if it does anything. Um, so, you know, and again, I said, I think there's something physically wrong. And meanwhile, while I'm talking to them, my brain is showing me how to end my life in that office. So no matter what um, space I was in, my creative brain was showing me exactly what I would need to do in that space. And by now I had nicknamed this thing going on in my brain, the imposter. Cause it felt like my brain had been hijacked. Yeah. Um, and it gave me like a quick, quicker way to reference it, um, which was helpful. Um, but I, so always, I just, I I just always, want to say a lot of what you're saying, I can relate to secondary because I had a relative who went through something similar where strep went through their blood brain barrier and they had actually their brain was inflamed but for years it was psychiatric mm -hmm. and they were getting worse because nobody was and, and, and same thing no there's something physically wrong and they that's really I'm sorry you went through that it's a lot it's difficult. It is, so, um, I'm sorry, your friend went through that. It's going through that. So, um, the first antipsychotic drug that I was put on, which is called Resperidone, um, mm -hmm. what it actually did was it built like a brick wall in my head. Um, uh, the, the, what I was seeing was still behind the brick wall. But it was kind of like um, hiding it from me, if that makes sense. The problem mm -hmm. was I had a severe like reaction to the drug. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I couldn't. I was just had. I just had these extreme like jitters and um, leg and arm flails and things. And they had to wean me off of that to try another one. So I was in that psychiatric ward for two and a half weeks. And I just want to, I just want to read a comment real quick, Amy. Uh, John says, I think the experience of not being heard is an even more familiar experience for women. Sad, but true. And that is a fact because like women wait on average three to seven years longer than a man for the same diagnosis. Mm. That's pretty sad statistic consider yeah. but anyhow continue i just wanted to read that comment yeah. that was pertinent um so um i was realizing in the in the ward that um it was probably going to take some time to figure this out <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I didn't want it had to, already been for a long time now. Nobody listening to you. Time to figure this out. I, I was realizing this is gonna be a trial and error thing. And I was also realizing that I don't think I will act on what what the imposter is showing me. I was gaining confidence that I can do this from home. Um, and you're getting I, worse through all of this. Like it's you're not getting better. Right, I guess all that is happening is at this point was I was seeing this in my head nonstop. Like it was literally 24 hours a day. The only the only way I wasn't seeing it was if I was sleeping. So from home, I was at home back at my house in Lyman, Maine. Um, I was and that, another fun fact. I my first house was in Lyman, Maine that I owned when I got married. <laughs> I was on Goodman's Um So at at my um, house, I was assigned a um, local psychiatrist who would basically be the person assigning trying the different drugs on me. We would try like experiment with the different drugs from home. The second one um, put up more of like a it was like a brick wall with lots of holes in it so it really didn't do anything mm -hmm. um so a third one was tried um in the end i would 
would go cycle through eight different antipsychotic drugs between March and November. Um, none of the rest of them doing anything. And in about um, six months into this, I started to lose all control of the muscles in my body, including the muscles in my face. And um, and I also, at times, couldn't speak at all. So I, the connection between my brain and my mouth was kind of severed. Um, at times or other times, I would think the words that I want to say and gibberish would come out. And then if I could talk, it was extremely um, difficult. Um, pushing, like trying to push the words to muffle that it become like a hard clay. And at this point, you're still at home, correct? You're still well, at, I'm home. at home. Um, and still having the non-top, non-stop psychosis which um i had kind of was just calling it by this point of suicidal psychosis um so the eighth or seventh or eighth drug um gave me the side effect of suicidal ideation and that's how i ended up back in the second, like how I ended up in another psych ward because the antipsychotic drug to try to stop my psychosis actually made me suicidal yeah. for a little while. And then back in. it was very frustrating. Um, that second psych ward, I think I, if I remember, I was in for two weeks. Same thing, explain to a whole other psychotherapist that. You know, this what's happening. I think there's something wrong with my brain. Kind of hoping maybe talking to another person might be helpful. Again, he just had never seen anything like it. And again, when they weaned me off that any psychotic and shared me on the seventh or whatever one it was, um, I regained that confidence that I could do this from home. Um, but yeah, so by now, um, I was had these non-stop images in my head and also didn't have control over my body. By now, it's about 15 months into this. And because I was a, uh, um, a recognized artist in my state, there um, was a big story in the newspaper um, with a picture of me on the front page sharing what I was going through. And um, I, I, while I felt vulnerable, everyone knowing, like all these people knowing what I was, what was happening, um, I was also uh, um, hopeful because I felt, well, perhaps someone will read this and recognize something, have experience yeah. something similar, or have some ideas on what to try next. Um, and that was really helpful. Uh, you mentioned inflammation. I got an article sent to me from someone uh, who had an article about a connection between brain inflammation and suicidal ideation and encouragement to um, keep on um, trying to figure out inflammation to see if that's what's going on. So by now, I was also assigned a new primary care physician. So I'm seeing this person for the first time and telling them my story. Meanwhile, I'm, I can only um, get around outside my house in a wheelchair because any stimulation beyond the quiet of my face would make the flailing muscles and difficulty speaking more challenging. Um, so I'm talking to this new primary care physician, explaining the whole thing to her. And um, she said, yes, I've never seen anything like this before. And and I gave her the article about brain information and said, I asked her if there's, is there some way that we could perhaps um, reduce my inflammation? Or is there a way to like see if this is the cause, see if I have inflammation? 
in my brain. And she didn't really, she honestly, and she said, I really don't know what to do here. So she, she found that hopeful and she made a referral to a neurologist. And she said, well, let's in the meantime do a test. So she prescribed this over-the-counter anti-inflammatory drug. Um, a household anti-inflammation drug that she prescribed the highest dose that you can take. She said you can only take this for two weeks because it will give you liver damage if you take it uh, longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> though it's going to be a two-week test. It's, it's going to make you feel better, but it might not. <laughs> it might make you worse. It will be a two-week two test just to see what happens. So um, within four days, I noticed that of taking the anti-inflammation drug, um, the pictures in my head um, started to um, filter, like there was like a veil, like they were a little bit in the background. And on the eighth day, I woke up and I had perfect speech and I had all the control of my the muscles in my body. And um, I was just so excited because here is proof that there's mm -hmm. something physically wrong with my brain. So I have this information to go see the first of two neurologists. And um, he um, did all kinds of tests. He did spinal tap, he even tested for Lyme disease. Um, all kinds of, you know, encephalitis, Huntington's, Parkinson's, um, all just all different kinds of things. And um, and he said, you have information, but the numbers don't warrant concern. And I said, what do you mean they don't warrant concern? <laughs> what about the test that we did and the difference that they made? And he just, he just dismissed and he said as far as yeah. what you're seeing in your head i think you have late onset schizophrenia and need to go on a nice antipsychotic drug and just keep trying different drugs and he said and it may be that this movement that you're experiencing is caused by one or some of those antipsychotics that you've been on that it's caused part of dyskinesia my understanding now is that you have to be on one for a long time for that to be the cause of movement. So anyway, um, I wanted a second opinion from the letters that I was getting. People said, try Mass General. I, ta I talked to um, neurologist there, and he said the same thing, that the numbers really don't warrant concern. Um, he did say, though, that um, he kind of gave me a, a diagnosis for the symptom of my movement. He said that your your lack of control of your muscles and your difficulty speaking is making me think, reminding me of a lot of the war veterans that I've seen. What we call what you what that is, as far as that that symptom, we're calling that functional neurological disorder. And um, it's, it's caused by trauma. It can be caused by trauma. And he said, have you experienced any trauma recently? And I had just gotten done telling him the whole story about how I've been seeing these pictures in my head nonstop yeah. for 15 months. And I just, I had to pause for a second so I didn't start screaming at him. I was just so like frustrated and angry. I bet. I bet. I I'm bet. sure a lot of people would have screamed. And I, so I said as calmly as I could, I just told you I've been seeing pic pictures of my self-death nonstop for 15 months. It's traumatic. And he said, well, I think, I think that could be what's causing your movement. And he said, we have a program here that can help. Um, you resolve that functional neurological disorder, something you can totally recover from and get your, your body and your speech back. And we, we know we have the occupational therapy, speech therapy here to fix that. Um, 
I I appreciated that a lot, but the way the healthcare system works, I didn't have access to that treatment anyways, and it didn't address the cause in any way. It just he was just treating kind of what he could see or trying to. Yeah. And he thought I had schizophrenia too. Um, so, so how did you go from there to right. the natural path? So from just reaching out, you know, the people who sent articles, like articles and letters, that was the next thing to try, to try somebody that was going to do more sensitive testing or take out those numbers that the other doctors didn't think warranted concern more seriously. And that's when I saw a natural path in uh, Kennebunk, Maine. Maine. And um, I had sent my um, the whole story ahead of time, the article ahead of time. And I was sitting in a wheelchair across from him, and he said, um, I think you have neuro, you know, neurogenic inflammation, um, brain on fire, and it's what's, it's probably what's causing everything. And um, I'm going to do some tests to try to get a sense of where it came from. And then I'll know how to address it. I think um, it's important that people realize that there is no one test for one. Like, you can go to a doctor and they can be like, oh, I tested you flying, you don't have it. There are multiple tests. There are deeper tests. There are tests upon tests. <laughs> if you are having an issue and not getting answers, just keep it. Just like Amy did. Eventually she made it to the correct diagnosis. Brain on fire is exactly how they explained it to my family member as well. Their brain is literally on fire with inflammation. And, and I also learned that just advocating yourself for yourself. Is Absolutely. Key. You have to just keep, you have to, unfortunately, just, you just have to keep like pushing and pushing to be heard. Yeah. So he did a blood test right in his office. And saw that I had had Lyme disease in my past. Could have been years before. He said the point is, Amy, that it was, it's past Lyme disease. And we're finding that people who had Lyme disease that's, that was never treated or not treated enough. That sometimes it attacks the brain. Um, it's, it's You essentially have a brain injury. And you have to recover from it. You were finding that people are experiencing everything from fatigue, light sensitivity, um, things like that, uh, to the facial palsy, Parkinsonism, uh, loss of control of muscles, and all the way through psychiatric problems from uh, major depressive disorder to obsessive, obsessive compulsive behavior to psychosis. Um, and, and that's what I, and he said, this is what I think is the cause. And he said that um, I know how to fix this, all of this. He said, um, what we're going to do is you're going to go on an anti-inflammation diet. And I'm going to prescribe um, like brain strengthening supplements to help heal your brain. He said, your symptoms are probably going to get better and go away in reverse order, which means that whatever symptom came last, and at this point it was fatigue, I was sleeping like 20 hours a day, um, that's going to get better first. And as he's telling me this, I'm thinking um, I've had the psychosis was the very first thing. It's been 15 months um and i try to keep my chin up so he um i started eating these foods um really good brain foods with salmon and spinach and kale and walnuts <laughs> everything everything in the anti-inflammatory and, yeah. and no sugar brain power yeah. diet lots of different um brain supplements I tell people all the time, if you are having an issue and you can't figure out what it is and neither can your doctors, ask 
about inflammation or at least try an inflammation diet, anti-inflammation diet, because yeah, so. anti-inflammatory diet can change someone's life if it's inflammation yeah. that's causing their health care problems. Yeah. So, I really think that's a big issue. So within, um, I don't remember how long it took, but within like a few months, Oh, it was about five, in five months, I um, had uh, my fatigue was better or sleeping, you know, 14 hours a day instead. And I noticed that um, um, my muscles were a little easier to control and my speech was a little better. So I was able to progress at this point from my wheelchair to a walker. Um, but the psychosis was still nonstop, and it had been 20 months. Um, so I, I mentioned to my naturopath, I want to keep doing what we're doing, but I can't wait to see, like, how long it's going to take for this to start to tackle the psychosis. Like, this, these other things are not my mm -hmm. priority. If I have to have palsied speech and be wig, you know, my body be wiggy for the rest of my life. I don't care. Like I need to get these pictures and movies to stop playing in my head. So I um talked to my assigned psychiatrist and she did a referral for electroconvulsive therapy. That was other that was more information I had received in all the letters that I got that when medication doesn't work, sometimes ECT um is the only thing that can. So um, I met with the ECT doctor, and she said the same thing. I've never seen anything like this before, where somebody is so yeah. suicidal, but not suicidal. I have no idea if this is going to help at all, but I'm willing to try. So I had um, 16 ECT treatments over the course of two months. And um, it's definitely one of the scariest things I've ever done, even though it's changed so much. It's a lot less invasive now. It's not like hoopoo's nest anymore. Yeah. Um, Thank you gosh. Put on, you, you put on your anesthesia, you're given a paralytic, so you're, you're, you don't convulse. Um, and it's just so much less invasive. Um, but I still found it very scary, and of course. Mm -hmm. um, my brain means a lot to me. And... Um, and the and being put on there, I found very scary. So they want she wanted me to do at least twenty four treatments, but after sixteen, I said I really need a break, and I'll come back if I need to. I woke up the morning of my sixteenth treatment, and I'm coming to the coming to the end of the story. Woke up from my sixteenth um, treatment, and for the first time in twenty two months, I saw something in my brain other than what the imposter had been selling me on you know, stuff. And it was a um it was my face, um really close to my own face, well, like right in front of me. And all this color was radiating from my eyes, nose and mouth. And um and as soon as I realized that I was seeing something else in my brain, the imposter came back. As soon as I made that connection, I was seeing something up. Um, and I just thought it was so amazing that I was seeing something else in my brain because I, I, I hadn't seen anything else in so long. And then I thought, well, let me just see what happens if I try to bring it back. And I found that I could. I could bring that image back into my brain, kick the imposter out for a second and then the imposter would come back in Get on the boot. it was very exciting um and it and it took a lot of effort so i i did it as often as i thought to and as long as i had energy for every day and after a few months i had um reduced the number of times that i saw the imposter's images to 100 times a day, and another several months is down to 50, and another several months is down to 20. It took two years for the psychosis to be completely gone after doing the ECT. Uh, meanwhile, 
um, because of the work I was doing with my naturopath, I had progressed from walker to cane. And I, by the way, I just very quickly want to say I bedazzled my walker and my chain. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Because I noticed, and I know a lot of people with disabilities can relate to this, people don't look at you and they don't talk to you and they're... Um, or they'll treat you like a child. Yeah. yeah, and I found that as soon as I did that, I was making a connection with people, making them smile and making them more comfortable. Yeah. As an extrovert, I needed to bedazzle. That's awesome. So um, before we run out of, because we're getting late in time, but I do want to um, ask you, can you talk about how uh, music, how you use the music to help you heal? Yeah, that's, what that's what I'm going. Okay, because I want to leave you time to be able to play us a song. Yeah. I'm watching the time. Oh, thank well, you. Um, yeah. We're gonna get her a job. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you got your own show. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, so, I'll, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So by now, so this is all. This gets me all the way up to um, a little over a year and a half ago. Um, and by then, by then, I had progressed back to my feet, so I didn't really need the cane as much anymore either, or if at all. Um, but I was still quite palsied um, with my speech. It had improved quite a bit. Um, if you go through my TikTok, and I hope people watching this um, will follow me on TikTok and things. If you go to the very first video, you can kind of see what my speech was like pre-ukulele. Um, a year and a half ago, I was uh, um, feeling really isolated. You know, in, in Lyme, it's very rural. I had been secluded pretty much to my home because of this, unless my husband got me out, and I really appreciated how much he did that as often as he could. Um, but I felt just, I was really frustrated being dependent and so what do I need to do to, to um, get my palsy back? And I was still having dystonia, which is just the curving of my wrist. And I was also still having um, what I was calling mini seizures, um, which I won't get into, but it was part of the whole movement thing. And, and I could feel like a disconnect in my brain. It was happening. And I, I thought about... Um, how to unisolate, unisolate myself would be to like be able to drive a car again, which I couldn't do having the seizures. So to drive a car, you have to be able to do multiple things at the same time. And I intuited that perhaps if I learned an instrument and play an instrument every day, um, kind of like how I practice seeing that picture in my head every day, maybe I'll reconnect or make new neural pathways. I didn't really know. It was something that I intuited that I might try to see what would happen. So my mom has um, Alzheimer's and it runs in my family. And I asked my doctor what things I could do to help improve my brain so that hopefully I can not have that same path for myself. And the number one thing he said was learn music, That's any music, an instrument, singing, reading music, anything with music. Well, yeah, so I went on Facebook Marketplace and I bought myself a ukulele because I tried learning the guitar when I was a kid. My uncle had let me one and the strings fit my fingers and there's more strings. I thought a ukulele might be easier to learn. Um, and it came with a little slip of, pa slip of paper showing you where to put your fingers for different chords. Um, and I used an app on my phone learn some songs and within a week of playing the ukulele um i was capable of perfect speech um most of the time so right now i'm probably because i'm overstimulated i typically have normal speech um in general unless i have stimulation it's kind of like when my movement was really bad it'd be worse if i was in a busy place the same thing kind of happens, still happens now. Yeah. Um, but when I play 
the ukulele, something kind of connects. And um, my, spe my speech is, is more um, normal. So I practice every day. I play it as occupational therapy every day for half an hour to an hour. And since doing that, starting to do that a year and a half ago, my speech, even when I'm palsied, has improved a lot. And like I said, my speech is typically normal. And if you go to my TikTok account, you can see the difference between the first and the last. Yeah, um, all of um, Amy's links, every single one of her links are in the description of this video on Facebook. So... I thought I would play you a song just to kind of illustrate yeah. this. And um, can you tell them, I know you play every Tuesday, correct? Yeah, so I try to post try to post a new song every Tuesday, and then every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, <laughs> or 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if I can't play at 10, I play, I do my occupational therapy live on TikTok. <laughs> Just to um, have more opportunity to answer the questions and things. Um, I think it's fantastic how you are using your story that's still unfolding to help <laughs> others and raise awareness. So I thought I thought I would play this song by Kansas today. It's a song called Carry On Wayward Son. <laughs> nice. And it's, um, I, know, I learned, I try to learn five new songs every week as part of my occupational therapy. And it's really helpful, I think, in my brain to challenge myself in that way. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Once I rose above the noise and confusion Just to get a glimpse beyond this illusion I was soaring ever higher But I flew too high Though my eyes could see, I still was a blind man. Though my mind could think, I still was a madman. I hear the voices when I'm dreaming. I can hear them say, Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more, no. Masquerading as a man with a reason. My charade is the event of the season And if I claim to be a wise man It surely means that I don't know On a stormy sea of moving emotion Tossed about, I'm like a ship on the ocean. I set a course, ruins a fortune. But I hear the voices say, Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest Don't you cry no more, no Carry on, you will always remember Carry on, nothing equal 
clouds this winter. Now your life's no longer empty. Surely heaven waits for you. Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more, no. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that was intensely beautiful. You have, and I saw MM backstage <laughs> just glowing like, see? This I never know whether to laugh or cry, I mean, smile or cry, you know? It's, it's just, just so beautiful. It, it is absolutely stunning. And of course, everyone in the audience is just absolutely loving it. So they're going to want to go and follow you. And again, go to yes. the station, like MM said, follow and follow Stacey. her. You can get more of her. Amy Stacy Curtis. That's right. <laughs> um, Amy. Uh -huh. In the last minute or two that we have, is what would you like um, our audience to take away from tonight and your story? I would really like people to take away that um, you have to just keep fighting for yourself. I feel like this whole first half of my life, I've been fighting to heal. I thought I was done healing before all this, this started. And it just gave me another thing to get through, and it was worth fighting for again. I think that's why I had the courage to fight for it, because I'd already been through the hardest thing in my life. So I knew that I was going to get through this, and that helped. But self-advocate and keep fighting um, to get better and heal. Probably so worth it. It's so worth it. And, you know, Emma's has done some um, other shows about medical gaslighting. This is an important topic that we really need to keep people aware of that you have to advocate for yourself. You can't just expect the medical professionals to have all of the same interest, intensity and time to project manage your health. So you are the prime example of someone who you were dogged, tenacious, and you knew what was going on and you coordinated everyone together. And so even though you were getting medically gaslit, you just kept plowing through. You're like MM because MM also <laughs> does not give up. And just because someone's wearing a white coat and a stethoscope does not mean that they know your case better than you, right M? Yeah, and I like to say it, you would be surprised at the number of people who will go through a drive-through and order a cheeseburger and yeah. get around the corner and it's got something on it it's not supposed to have or if they ask for it with only mustard and it's got ketchup and they will park their car get out of their car and go into the store or the restaurant to complain and get the right cheeseburger but they'll go to a doctor who doesn't listen to them and they know something else is wrong the doctor will dismiss them and they're like okay doctor <laughs> the end yeah like it's yeah, shocking how they do yes. they have the They're white, white no. let us go yeah so maybe um maybe we need to do another show about medical gaslighting maybe even have amy mm -hmm. on as a panelist i don't know but i think this is a very yeah. powerful topic so thank and you i'm happy here yeah happy. all right there we go mm also is an expert in this realm she knows everything about this and she can help people and patients to be empowered and to project manage their own health not yes. to outsource it to anyone you're in control of your health so thank uh, you so much amy yes. thank you for honoring us by coming on i know it's a lot and it's tiring for you your song was beautiful i don't think anybody is expecting your angelic voice when they hear you with your, you know, your, your speech. It's so and then good. It's crazy. It's crazy. like an angel. It's like an angel <laughs> singing. It's amazing. So I'm going to be checking you out with your live streams as well. I know everyone is here. And then maybe we can put together a medical, another medical gaslighting show. Yeah. Um, Cause I was inspired by hearing your story. And I think even if somebody doesn't have a medical condition, you probably will at some point or someone you love will. So we all yeah. need to become experts um, here. And thank you to our wonderful audience with the amazing encouragement and the great, great. Thanks um, for the replay crew. Replay and make sure you guys follow Cosmos Creative TV everywhere. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks, Amy. Bye. Bye.